So good afternoon. I know there's a lot of great conversation. Good afternoon. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back? Great, great. So welcome, everyone. Um, this is our 12th annual, hard to believe 12 years already, Global Health Day Symposium. And I'm Jean Witowski wendy I'm dean of the School of Public Health and Health Professions. And um, every we, year we organize this and have a number of different topics that we've shared over the years. And um, this year, uh, Dr. Mu and the committee selected the topic of women's health. And it's especially important to me. I'm a women's health researcher. One of uh, the studies that I have been involved with uh, actually the month of March was 30 years since we started the Women's Health Initiative. Hard to believe, but uh, it's been a long-term study. We're funded through uh, the year 2027, and we're already talking about a renewal, if you can believe that. So it's been great. Um, so that study helped us to understand many issues around menopausal health. But we have a number of different topics today they will be discussed in relation to women's health that have both local and global impacts. So what are environmental exposures? Uh, uh, what do we know about uh, nutrition, cancer? And these topics all have global relevance. We're, uh, we have a number of different speakers, and those include uh, colleagues from across the country, um, colleagues from our uh, Jacob School, and also um, uh, some presentations of some of our students, which I think is going to be terrific today. So uh, I'm hoping that this day will open conversation, give people ideas about how to collaborate on some new research and what other work needs to be done. Um, I especially want to thank Lena, who takes, uh, she is the director of our Office on Global Health Initiatives and very uh, active in the school. Jen Foster, who works closely with her, and uh, the two of them and their team that put together this this uh, symposium. So let me introduce Lena Mew. She's associate professor of the Department of Epidemiology and Environmental Health, director of our Office of Global Health Initiatives in the school, and she'll talk a little bit more about the event and the speakers. So thank you. Hope you enjoy the afternoon. Thank you, Jean, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you all to the Global Health Symposium. Uh, so we're very lucky today to have uh, uh, speakers, distinguished speakers from Duke University, from University Albany, and also many colleagues from UB, and also from our community. And this is really, as Jean mentioned, the first time we have some graduate student going to give a short talk about uh, their research. I hope you all enjoy the, um, their presentation and also um, the discussion. So after each of the talk, we'll have a, uh, a little bit of time for a few questions, and then we'll have the panel discussion where you can ask more uh, questions there. All right. Thank you so much, Jim. So we'll hold more questions for later um, panel discussion, and I'll introduce our second keynote speaker, Dr. Aaron Bell. Um, Dr. Bell is a professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and Environmental Health in the School of Public Health, University at Albany. Um, her research focuses on environmental exposure as related to reproductive and child outcome. Dr. Bell is currently the uh, co-PI of two cohort study, the Upstate Kids Study and the Health Study of New York State Community uh, exposed to PFAS contaminated drinking water founded by uh, ATSDR. And he has served on several National uh, Academy of Medicine Committee, including the Committee to Review the House Effect 
of Vietnam veteran of exposure to herbicide, <clears throat> and also the Committee on Guidance on PFAS testing and health outcome. And today her talk will be global implication of the PFAS exposure and perinatal health. What do we know? What do we don't know? And what we are learning? Welcome, Dr. Bell. There we go. How's that? All right. All right. Well, thank you very much <clears throat> for inviting me today. It's, it's been a number of years since I've been able to uh, visit Buffalo. I grew up not too far from here. Uh, and Buffalo was a, a wonderful partner with our Upstate Kids Study, and I'll speak a little bit about that today. Um, the last few years, uh, we've been very immersed in the health effects and concerns around PFAS exposure, and this is where I'll focus uh, my comments today. So PFAS, so per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, it's a mouthful. Uh, there is a family of chemicals. There are 12,000 uh, of these uh, chemicals in the family. Uh, they have been heavily used in industry and in our consumer products, particularly as water repellents, nonstick services like Teflon, uh, stain-resistant fabrics, and firefighting foams. So uh, they're persistent. They, they don't degrade. Uh, they're, uh, again, uh, ubiquitous in our uh, environment. They can migrate into soil and water during production uh, and use, and hence uh, the potential for exposure to um, people. And where we really first became aware of uh, health concerns around these types of exposures was with the contamination of public water supplies, in the, with, particularly around PFOA, which is uh, also referred to as C8, and that is the primary component of Teflon, so those nonstick pans. Uh, and again, uh, companies and communities that lived near the production facilities uh, had the potential to have that contaminated drinking water. After that, though, once we started to look, we noticed other communities also had contaminated public drinking water systems and private wells, particularly those around military bases because of the firefighting foam. And that's actually a different type of PFAS, and it's a mixture of PFOS and PFH excess. And as you'll hear today, most of our knowledge is around just two, or sometimes three, out of the 12,000. Uh, so this is, this is where we have focused a lot of our research. Uh, we can also have exposures in, in one of the newer areas right now is with emissions. Uh, this came up with the East Palestine train derailment uh, as they uh, used firefighting foam on the, the rail cars, which they had to do. Uh, so in addition to the dioxin, they now have PFAS to concern themselves with and, and what happens when we try to incinerate or get rid of the waste from, from those applications. And of course, they're not easily incinerated. So it results in, in deposition of, of um, the emissions elsewhere. Uh, food packaging, the fast food packaging, microwave popcorn, pizza boxes, those types of anything where there's a nonstick service, we have potential for exposure. We've increasingly found uh, measurable amounts in wildlife and in fish and the meat and dairy industry. Um, the sludge from wastewater treatment plants, um, because it is not filtered out, these PFAS are not filtered out, and that sludge is reapplied to farmland. So we've increasingly found, particularly in Maine, in Michigan, in some areas of the southwest, um, extensive contamination in those areas. And then, of course, occupational workers, especially firefighters, including the volunteer firefighters, which we have here in upstate New York. Children and infants are a particular interest and concern for several reasons. We know these, these chemicals can um, pass uh, in utero into the infant directly through the placenta. We all know that the placenta is not a good guard keeper, right? It lets a lot of things through. And we also are able to measure these substances in breast milk, and I'll talk more about that uh, later today. So... The older PFAS, the ones that were used for legacy, so the PFOA, the PFOS, are extremely persistent. They don't degrade. Half-lives are measured in years. We do know that half-life is different for men and women because of pregnancy history and breastfeeding history. And that's important from an epidemiology standpoint for our methods as if we have one measure, one blood sample um, taken at, say, age 50, that half-life and the concentrations will very much be 
um, implicated or directed by that um, woman's uh, pregnancy and breastfeeding history, and I'll, I'll speak more to that later. Um, the newer PFAS have a much shorter half-life, uh, uh, sometimes hours and days and weeks rather than years. However, as we're seeing out of, out of North Carolina and the other states that have contamination with the newer PFAS that were designed to replace PFOA and PFOS as they were phased out, they're seeing some of the same health effects. Um, and again, this, the structure is largely the same. They're just less persistent. So less persistent doesn't necessarily mean safe. And uh, there's a concern there. Uh, the uh, PFAS family, uh, they bind to serum protein. They are reabsorbed through the kidney. So we see a lot of kidney health effects. There's implications on the PPP, PPAR mechanism activity, which influences lipids, uh, also influences um, our hormone and endocrine systems. And that's where we see a lot of the potential health effects related uh, to this family. With regards to water contamination, which is where much of the focus has been, uh, up until now, and, and still right now, there's a, there's a rule proposed by EPA. It's in discussion. Uh, but there is no federal requirement um, for that regulated testing. And so there's, there's quite a disparity across the United States in terms of where public water is tested. But where it has been tested, uh, we see it in every state. Um, and in terms of what we do know with uh, the PFAS family, it's global. It's not limited to the United States. Uh, again, very similar to the map I just showed you with the United States, uh, Europe, and Asia, uh, where they have been measuring for this PFAS have found measurable, effect, uh, measurable amounts uh, and, again, um, have uh, keep detecting larger contamination and sources of contamination with regards to, to this family. In addition, an article that came out just about a year ago uh, garnered a lot of attention. It looked at global samples, which is what the, the, each of the columns represents, of uh, rainwater in deposition. And we're able to measure, um, again, the PFAS family within rainwater deposition globally. The hatch marks are showing the differences in uh, regulatory policy levels set by either the EU or the EPA. Um, and again, just like in the United States, when you look globally, we are all over the map in terms of what our standards are in terms of um, what the safe levels should be in water as well uh, as the concentrations in populations. Uh, and again, this is, and again, speaking to just kind of the evolving nature of this area of work. Given this article, as well as the other health effects that seem to be emerging, the EU, which always tends to be a little bit ahead of the United States because they operate on the precautionary principle, um, is arguing for looking at the PFAS as a family rather than as individuals. And they are, uh, again, under a proposed rule right now for looking at um, regulatory um, levels in drinking water. In the United States and in New York specifically, we have the Environmental Public Health Tracker. I've pulled out, and I, I'll leave you these slides so you can have, uh, we have links to all of these. I've pulled out the Buffalo Water Authority in Tonawanda uh, with regards to what we can currently measure with PFOA. So PFOA was phased out in the early 2000s. All right, so we're 20 years in from that phase out in, in the United States. So the Buffalo Water Authority, uh, the max average uh, measured in 2021 was at 6.4, with the average at 2.7 nanograms per liter. So in, in general and under the current standards in New York, that's great. It's below 10, which is what the current level is. The new EPA proposed rule has set the, the average level at four parts per trillion. To give you perspective in who's at Falls, New York, which is kind of Towards, it's, it's actually that most of the people seek their health care in Vermont. So it's right on the border, um, about an hour from east of Albany. Uh, when that contamination was first measured with PFOA, it was uh, the public drinking water system had 600 parts per trillion uh, in terms of, of what they're dealing with. So for those of us who have been around a while, the story is actually very similar to lead and that as the regulatory levels, as we learn more, we keep lowering uh, the level, and uh, the same thing is happening with the PFAS as we um, continue to do research in this area. 
in terms of both Hoosick Falls and then Newburg, in 2016, when the water contamination was discovered, the New York State Department of Health started a biomonitoring program for the residents of Hoosick Falls. And the following year, when uh, they looked at Newburg with regards to PFOS, they did the same thing. What I want to point out to you with these results is to show you that those on the public water systems that were contaminated, so within the village of, of Hoosick Falls or the city of Newburgh, had the higher concentrations of PFOA and PFOS. So we know that if the water source is contaminated, it is correlated with the higher concentrations in the blood that we can measure um, once, once we have detected that contamination. As I mentioned uh, just about a month ago, uh, EPA uh, issued a proposed ruling for the maximum contaminant level for public drinking water. This is important because it would cover all public drinking water systems. One of the reasons Hoosick Falls uh, slipped under the radar for so long is that it's a small village of 3,000 people. They were exempt from, from the monitoring that was ongoing at that time. So the new rule that is under consideration is set at four parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS for these public drinking water systems, and then a hazard index for the mixture of four additional PFOS, two of which were replacements for PFOA and PFOS. So this is very similar to what we see in environmental epidemiology. We identify a problem, we ban it, and replace it with something else, and then a few years later we realize we have to study what we replaced it with, right? So the, the same thing is starting to happen here. But I also want to point out this is six out of 12,000, right? So we have, we have a ways to go before understanding this. And as I mentioned uh, two years ago, the health department for New York State set PFOA and PFOS drinking water standards at 10 uh, for the state. They are obviously reconsidering that, that now with a new proposed rule with EPA, and they're also looking at an additional 23 uh, PFOS. So New York... Michigan, uh, and a few other states are a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of what they're regulating and the number that they're regulating. Historically, what we know um, with regards to, to health effects uh, related to these PFAS come out of the C8 study. So the, the C8 study is the PFOA uh, contamination that occurred in West Virginia. Uh, there, a lawsuit was filed, and part of the lawsuit was to enroll 69,000 uh, residents uh, of the area into uh, a study where uh, they obviously drew blood, had questionnaires, and out of those analyses, um, the, the scientific team designated from a legal standpoint health concerns uh, that were more or likely probable as a result of the C8 exposure. Uh, all of this was outlined in both a documentary and a movie. Uh, they, they, if for those of you, I can tell you about afterwards uh, uh, if you're interested. But the, the health effects here are listed, and since we are trying to focus on perinatal health today, I um, want to draw your attention to the pregnancy-induced hypertension that came out of those studies. In addition, since those studies first came out, additional studies have been done largely with the NHANES data, but also with cohort and case control studies that had stored blood samples available. And again, additional outcomes that, um, based on both the animal research and on these additional cross-sectional surveys and smaller cohort and case control studies, endocrine disruption is, is clearly a concern. Uh, lower antibody production. So this largely came out of the Faroe Islands and children. Um, who did not show those with high exposures um, did not have the antibody response to vaccines um, as high as those that did not have the higher exposures. And since then, a number of studies have uh, demonstrated a similar association for adults, uh, and it is a, an ongoing concern. Uh, infertility, breast cancer, infant birth weight, child development, uh, onset of puberty, and then childhood cancer hit, for the most part has not been studied. We all know how challenging that is, but it is an understudied uh, component with regards to these health effects. For this reason, and because in communities that were, were um, experiencing these exposures were asking and getting frustrated when they went to their clinicians and the clinicians didn't know what to do with this information, 
the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine convened a committee to review the literature and to provide uh, clinical guidance uh, as it stands with um, the perfluorinated chemicals. Uh, and this report was released uh, last June. And uh, in that, uh, the committee uh, reviewed all of the current literature, including the systematic reviews that have been released and any new literature that had come out, and then um, also provided guidance on clinical guidance. In terms of the health effects that the committee identified as, as the, the, the literature, both uh, the epidemiology literature specifically, but backed up by the animal toxicology research, there's sufficient evidence, meaning there's, there's a lower amount uh, and, and uh, minimal bias in the papers that have come out uh, with these outcomes for decreased antibody response, dyslipidemia or high cholesterol, decreased infant and fetal growth, and increased risk of kidney cancer. In addition, the committee outlined that there is more of a mixed result from, from the literature with regards to a number of health outcomes, but given the animal literature and given the, the number of analyses that have been done that, that are very suggestive, they're saying, you know, these are things we need to keep an eye on and keep trying to push the science forward with uh, additional work, and that would include increased risk of breast cancer, testicular cancer, liver enzyme alterations, and then again, pregnancy-induced hypertension, thyroid disease and dysfunction, and increased risk of ulcerative colitis. With regards to the clinical guidance, the committee used data um, primarily uh, generated from risk assessment and hazard assessment work done uh, in Germany and in uh, e the EU. And based on that work, decide as well as the challenge of that we don't have a lot of information on a, a large number of the individual PFAS. Uh, they uh, set the standard for current clinical guidance at uh, higher than two nanograms per milliliter of the sum of the PFAS together. Um, again, based on what we know now. So for those with uh, a blood concentration of two to uh, 20 nanograms per milliliter, recommendations were made to uh, monitor for clinically uh, dyslipidemia in children and adults, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, and screening for breast cancer. For, and based on that 2 to 20, a large number of the population will fall into that category. So in some way, this is the standard of care, but remember we have many communities who are exposed who may not, because they're in environmental justice communities, may not have that standard of care. So this is um, a pretty significant uh, clinical guidance. And for those with greater than 20 nanograms per milliliter, again, the, the same um, clinical guidance as for the 2 to 20, but adding in thyroid function uh, and kidney cancer screening uh, for those um, exposed individuals. So in general, what do we know? Well, we know there's widespread global PFAS contamination, but regulation varies widely. Certain occupations are at risk of exposure. Uh, we know that environmental and occupational exposure leads to measurable concentrations in infants, children, and adults. While concentrations are decreasing for PFAS that have been phased out of production, other PFAS are taking their place, and we can't guarantee that they're safe. Um, environmental uh, concentrations, particularly from drinking water and occupational exposures, are correlated with the blood concentrations in people. We have measurable amounts in newborns and in breast milk, and there are certain perinatal health effects that are consistently associated with PFOS, especially preeclampsia, and especially with PFOS and PFOA. What we don't know. I mentioned there are 12,000 of these, right? So we're not going to solve that today, but we're also never going to catch up if we go one at a time, right? And we can't, um, you know, wait for all of that information to um, become available, and that is why a number of organizations, both in the United States and in Europe, are arguing that we might need to start thinking about uh, regulating the, the PFAS as a class, or at least some level of a grouping or a mixture that we identify with the science. Uh, and the same, uh, as I mentioned, is also being done on, from the EU in terms of arguing for that. That same National Academy of Medicine Committee 
uh, also uh, brought forth a number of evidence gaps related to reproductive and children's health that I wanted to highlight today. Uh, there is a need, again, because of, of confirmation through or uh, suggestions through animal research and the, the laboratory-based research, that developmental outcomes other than birth weight are important to look at. Again, that PPAR mechanism and the ability to interfere with that and the placentation, um, uh, particularly with the trophoblasts, um, as that relates to both preeclampsia but other developments related to neurodevelopment of the infant will be important to look at. There's a, a great need to look at cancers other than kidney and testicular cancer. Uh, and, and in fact, the committee highlighted breast cancer uh, related to that. Male and female reproductive effects. A paper just came out in the last couple of weeks highlighting the, the need to look at both male and female factor infertility markers uh, and trying to understand what might be happening there. Uh, endocrine disorders other than thyroid hormone levels, gestational diabetes, and then exposure related to and the subsequent impact due to breastfeeding. And I want to spend a little time on that um, because it is such an important finding from that committee and um, from a number of others in the field. About a year ago, uh, EHP published um, an extensive review on breast milk um, and the amount of PFOS, uh, particularly PFOA and PFOS, that uh, were measurable uh, from populations that were sampled across the United States. And you'll see here, they've put in the hatch marks where the regulations are, were at the time. And again, a number of the samples from these populations in the breast milk uh, exceeded um, the, the standard ex uh, um, criteria that we have in drinking water. This paper actually just came out last week. And this is uh, work out of China where in this case, they're actually showing the estimated daily intake level of a one-month-old based on samples of breast milk that they took throughout China. And again, the, the red dashed line uh, is the uh, estimated daily quality uh, quantity intake um, that is set forth by EPA. And you can see there are obviously a number of populations that exceed that level. So this is a very challenging subject. And when I go into the communities that have been exposed, it's the number one question I get. And it's incredibly difficult for the, the families because on the one hand, there is extensive literature telling us that breastfeeding is good, right? We know it's good for the infant. It can be a, um, also a protective risk factor uh, in, for the, the mother in terms of chronic disease and potentially for, for breast cancer. Uh, we know that other sources like formula and the water, obviously, that's used to make formula can also be contaminated with PFAS. And yet we're, we're, uh, we know that there's exposure when a mother breastfeeds her baby. And so the best correlation we have, if you look at the guidance for lead um, exposures and whether or not mothers uh, should uh, be encouraged to breastfeed, that clinical guidance is tied to a concentration. And you're supposed to monitor both the infant and the mother throughout that process as if there's a, a lead exposure. We don't have enough data yet to set that for the PFOS exposures. In addition, based on animal studies, there's a suggestion and a concern that the PFOS um, concentrations in the higher exposures may also lead to a reduction in milk production. Um, that's obviously a lot harder to just study in an epidemiology way, but a couple of smaller epidemiology studies have supported that, that work. Um, so again, we have two issues here. One is a biological impact on whether or not it um, can impede the, the production of milk, but then also you are exposure, exposing the infant. And so again, the recommendation here to clinicians was to acknowledge and make sure the mothers are aware that breastfeeding is good. We know it's a good thing. Most of the time, the, as far as we know right now, the benefit of breastfeeding should outweigh what the exposures will be, but we, can't, we don't know that for sure. And so to work on reduction. It is also um, because of the concern and the challenge that, that um, this um, presents to families, the committee also very strongly recommended that there be funding and research in this area as soon as possible. Um, because we need, we need additional data to set regulation. So what we don't know, a lot, right? We have 12,000 in the family. We don't have a good handle on mixtures. 
Many of the PFAS occur in mixtures. Firefighting foam is a mixture of the PFAS. And how do we use our statistical techniques? How do we use um, our approaches to understand that? We can't guarantee that less persistence means safe. And so how do we, how do we look at those? They're more difficult to measure, as we all know, uh, in biological samples if something's less persistent. But how do we, how do we get a good handle on that? Uh, we have a great deal we need to understand with regards to perinatal outcomes in most cancers. We need more data on breast milk uh, and breastfeeding. And from a global implication, much of what we know is from EU and China. We don't have a lot of information on the southern hemisphere, areas where that don't necessarily have a lot of infrastructure for um, uh, strong epidemiology studies and may not have regulation in place for contamination through drinking water. It would be easy to assume that this is a wealthy country problem because these are exposures from consumer products. But as we know from plastics and, uh, and our recycling stream and our wastewater stream and, again, the, the rainwater study, that this now leads to a global issue that has the potential to impact populations that don't have the resources to address it. So what are we learning in New York? So the Upstate Kids uh, is a, a cohort study of infants born between 2008 and 2010 uh, that we did here in New York. And the University of Buffalo was an, a partner in our follow-up effort with the, with the Upstate Kids study. It was originally designed to actually look at the um, influence of infertility treatment uh, on the, the development of children. And because it's a cohort study, we're able to look at a number of exposures beyond just the infertility treatment. Uh, we recruited from upstate New York and Long Island because at the time, the birth certificate, which is different for upstate New York than it is for New York City, um, had information on concept, mode of conception, on whether or not uh, children were conceived for, with infertility treatments. And this allowed us to do a matched exposure cohort study design and we frequency match on the fertility treatment status. So for every um, infant conceived with infertility treatment, we recruited three from the same regional um, perinatal network area uh, to be enrolled in our study, um, and all multiples. So we have 1,000 sets of twins in the, in the base cohort. When the infants were eight months old, we asked permission from the mothers to sample the newborn blood spots. We're fortunate in New York and that we keep them. Uh, Michigan's undergoing a lawsuit right now. They may be forced to no longer keep them, even for consented research. Um, but this is a, a benefit we have here in New York. And we asked permission to sample for chemicals and immune markers. And then of those with cons who did consent to that, the 3,000, we went back to them and said, could we also sample what's left if we had any remaining for DNA methylation and epigenetic changes? And then uh, the, we had a clinic follow-up when the children were around nine years old for five, with 559 of our children here at UB, University of Rochester, NYU, and that University at Albany. And this is just a, a schematic of the, the state and the perinatal network so you can get a feel. So we would have that geographic distribution uh, in, our, in our children. And we had a number of contacts, um, mostly through mail, except for the in-person clinic visits uh, that uh, the children uh, and their mothers uh, completed up through age nine. In terms of the numbers I want to show you today, as I mentioned, we just had over about 62% provided initial consent for us to use the newborn blood spot, and we were able to measure uh, for PFOA and PFOS in uh, three, just over 3,000, and again, we had 1,000 twins and 2,000 singletons. I didn't, I'm assuming, maybe I'm wrong, since we are at UB, that you all know what a Guthrie card is. Uh, that you've talked about that. Okay, excellent. Um, and so I didn't bring that slide, but uh, just to show you a picture, this was a method developed with um, our colleagues at the Wadsworth Center in, uh, at the New York State Department of Health. Uh, but uh, through the newborn, uh, collaboration with the newborn screening, um, the five heel sticks, we were able to, to obtain uh, punch samples from them uh, to measure 
BPA, PFOS, PFOA, and then we also measured cytokines and immunoglobulins in those samples. By state law, we have to keep one whole spot untouched um, for future analysis as uh, for newborn screening purposes in case there's any follow-up testing that they need. Uh, so we worked very closely uh, with our partners in newborn screening. Uh, the uh, LOD was uh, quite low at 0.05 and 0.03. 99% uh, of our children had a measurable amount of PFOA and PFOS. Now, on the one hand, the median level of concentration was, was low. I mean, these aren't high exposures, but I want to point your attention to the 75th percentile, which is greater than that too, that I told you about for the clinical guidance. So we do have a group that it, you know, is starting to, to at, at 36 hours of age, um, have um, measurable concentrations over that two nanograms per mil. And again, just a, a quick overview, um, our cohort is largely white, Higher education, again, we were focused on infertility treatment, so we have a higher educated uh, group, and we have about 20% um, of our moms gave birth uh, to twins. So in terms of the median concentrations of PFOA and PFOS by some key covariates, I wanted to draw your attention to parity. And again, as I alluded to earlier, um, the nulliparous moms have higher, uh, the infants of nulliparous moms had higher concentrations than uh, those uh, with our, uh, who are Paris, which again makes sense and speaks to um, the fact that there is that um, exposure in utero and um, during the, the delivery. We've published a number of papers um, with uh, these data. Uh, and for, uh, from a mechanism standpoint, we examined uh, the PFOA and PFOS and immunoglobulin patterns. And we did see a shift primarily with PFOA and Ig levels going in different directions. So again, as was alluded to earlier, we're still trying to figure out what the, all that means, but it does speak to um, and highlights the fact that there's potential to have a small shift at the biological level with these concentrations. Similarly, for DNA methylation, the continuous examination of PFOA and PFOS didn't really show much in terms of variation with DNA methylation. However, for those in the highest decile of concentration of PFOA and PFOS, we did see shifts in DNA methylation, particularly at sites that are known to be associated with neurodevelopment. So again, there's potential for biological mechanism changes even at these lower concentrations. We're currently looking at some machine learning techniques because we also measured 52 cytokines and we're, we're examining those, as well as ages and stages questionnaire uh, data for children up through age three. Uh, my doctoral student, Jordan, is looking at predictive markers like parity for exposure concentration that, that can um, help us understand how best to approach this from an epidemiology standpoint. Uh, my master's student will defend in a week and look at wheeze and asthma in the, uh, in the cohort and then food allergies. Now, in terms of birth weight and um, the ages and stages uh, development questionnaire, we haven't seen much. So this is good news. Um, but again, um, the, this is where the results have been mixed in the field in terms of looking at, and this is term birth weight, uh, in the singletons, the twins were very similar. Uh, and then again, the ages and stages, which is a screen for, for development through age three, we also didn't see much for either PFOA and PFOS uh, for singletons or twins. Where we did see a change is in the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which we administered at age seven. Uh, we had about just under 1,000 children in this analysis, and we do see an uptick, particularly with PFOA, uh, in uh, risk for pro-social behavioral difficulties. Uh, and again, this does and is supported by other literature in the field where PFOA tends to, to have a little bit more of an association when we do see one. Uh, and again, it's, it's the older ages as they are in school and those behavioral changes are starting to be noticed. Now, the other piece we're working on, I mentioned Huzik Falls in Newburgh. 
the CDC and ATSDR are funding a national multi-site PFAS health study. There are seven sites enrolled in this study, uh, and we are one of the sites, and I've put up some pictures here of our, our study teams in, in both communities. Who's it falls, as I mentioned, is about 3,000 uh, individuals, uh, I'm sorry, 3,000 residents in a village. Newburgh is a city of about 30,000 uh, with a median income of 38,000 uh, dollars a year. Uh, it is a, a majority um, black and Hispanic city, and they also have lead exposures. So one of when we, and we have a strong community engagement component uh, to this study. We are in the process of recruitment. Right now, we have a common core protocol across the seven sites, and then additional um, protocols for our site-specific based on feedback from our community members. Uh, again, looking at enrolling both adults and children uh, with uh, looking at many of the same out outcomes that I have already um, outlined today. And in terms of our site-specific projects, because we had the biomonitoring, the health department did the biomonitoring um, work ahead of time in Newburgh and Hoosick Falls, we are asking permission for each of the participants who also participate in the biomonitoring to access their stored samples so we can look at longitudinal changes. Uh, and this will allow us to, to develop future cohort, longitudinal cohort plans. But we're also going back to residents in both communities who gave birth over the last 20 years in those two locations because we want to now uh, measure PFAS in the newborn blood spots to look at changes over time but also to help us with methodological development in that exposure concentration. So how does, um, and we're, we have an extensive questionnaire for this, um, maternal parity and breastfeeding history um, relate and correlate with infant concentrations and how can that be used to then estimate exposure because we know that impacts the half-life. So where do we go from here? We need a lot of more information on fate and transport. Uh, particularly around emissions um, related to incinerators, but we also have exposures through landfills, um, what we've put onto agricultural crops and in, in the soil. So a lot of the exposure assessment work that we need to do um, is still needs to be outlined. Again, as I mentioned, less persistent doesn't necessarily mean safe. Uh, and so we need more information on the newer PFAS and how best to measure them and how to look at their health effects. We do need occupational studies on both military personnel and their families because they often live on the bases that are also have contamination. And firefighters, including volunteer firefighters, who are often not included in some of the professional occupational cohorts, um, and yet in upstate New York are a large proportion of the firefighters that could be exposed to this firefighting foam. Breast milk, we just need information across the board. We need a lot more data uh, in that area. We need exposure dose modeling um, that considers parity and breastfeeding history and detection. Don, if we, again, the, the goal EPA has put forth is at zero. Our chemistry tools are not yet strong enough to be able to do that. So we need improved detection methods and we need ideas and methods for remediation. I know our engineering department's working on some ideas and, and um, this is a, a, another great area for our environmental engineer collaborators to, to help us understand how best to remediate. From a perinatal health, we have a lot we need to learn with regards to fertility and fetal growth, uh, exposures and the life course. And that's the biggest question, second biggest question I get from families and communities that have been exposed after the breastfeeding question. They're like, what is going to happen to my child? Um, and it, given the exposures that they've had. Um, puberty, preeclampsia, thyroid, immune dysfunction and susceptibility. So we started, like everyone, impacted by the pandemic. So one of the other questions we got, because the communities are well-versed in the literature, they know that there's information out there that uh, antibody response to vaccines is lower in, in higher exposed communities. But they also want to know if it put their community at greater risk, were they more susceptible to infectious disease or are they more susceptible to immune-based diseases because of these exposures? So we, and it's a reasonable question. We don't have a good answer for it. Uh, and, and so that is an area of, of research. Neurodevelopment and behavior, and then of course, breast cancer. And with that, uh, I would like to thank my study participants and their families, our community partners, 
uh, in study and sponsored program staff and our, our funding agencies. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aaron. And now we'll invite uh, Dr. Jim Zhang to uh, come back and uh, you want to sit there. <laughs> and uh, we'll open for the questions. Uh, the speaker. I don't think that you can have this one. Just the, yeah. Okay. Any any question, Jean? Erin, thank you. That was a great talk. Um, how do you, assuming the uh, the breast milk is a reflection of the maternal environment, and the baby was just spent nine months gestating in the maternal environment. How, you know, would you expect those babies to have high levels regardless of breast milk? And then second, where do the PFASs exist? Do they exist in fat and bone? Where do they persist? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So yeah, in fact, when I meet with community members and they ask me this question, one of the things I suggest is that the mom can get tested for her blood concentration because what we are seeing and what they saw in this study out of China and, and other studies is if the, the mother has higher concentrations, you would expect um, the, the infant to have higher concentrations in utero regardless of whether or not there's breastfeeding and then obviously with breastfeeding there's potential to, to um, transfer. And the newborn blood spot analysis we did, given that the infants were 36 hours old and we know that that's most likely due to in utero transfer because the, the breast milk wouldn't have had a, enough time to, to have a measurable impact. Um, but again, in terms of what that number actually is, if there's a safe level, a threshold, um, how much um, uh, transfers to the infant in utero versus breast milk, we don't have a good handle on. And I think that's an area where we need to, to do. But in the meantime, what we could say to a mother is a good recommendation would be you get yourself tested um, if you're concerned about your exposure, and then if you're higher, then that's when you may be, need to make more decisions. Um, and I've already forgotten the second question. Where, where, where ah, so that yeah, it's right. So it's um, it binds to the serum protein. Um, it does not get stored in blood. It tends to get constantly reabsorbed through the kidney, which is why we see kidney damage. Um, and why we, we measured in the blood. The newer PFAS are excreted um, pretty quickly, um, but it is um, it does not get stored in fat in the same way that the PCBs do. Uh, so again, that's some of the other challenges we have is trying to understand. Um, so what we think now is that it interferes with the PPAR um, and it interferes with mechanisms, but then this long-term storage is, again, why we're measuring it in blood um, because it, binds to the serum uh, protein. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, Dana. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I have a question for each of you, if you don't mind, since I have the microphone. <laughs> uh, the first one is for Professor Zhang. I'm curious, when you look at health effects of PM 2.5, do you consider the other contam organic contaminants that are adsorbed on them uh, because the sources would be different from one city to another because of the organic pollutants? And then for Professor Bell, because this is kind of related, in, in breast milk, uh, do you find more PCBs that, because they're fat-loving than PFAS because they're more protein-soluble or protein-lover? So that's uh, you know that's a that's a question I think in 20 years we're probably still going to be asking, uh, which is the PM composition effect, Trey. Right? So uh, in the laboratory, if we do a toxicology study, we have a, a PM 2.5 with the you know more metals with the, compared to with the more carbon. You know we use diesel particles uh, compared with the. Uh, some organic aerosols that are formed through photochemical reaction, the toxic differences are there. But if you do the, in the, in the, in the, in the epidemiologist study, we just do not have a resolution to do that. 
So lots of that P was just the, you know, PM 2.5, it's PM 2.5, right? You do see difference from one study to another study, but we don't know what, uh, what could really cost the, that differences because populations are different, you know, that sort of thing. And even PM 2.5, is that really a PM 2.5 effect? Or is the PM 2.5 just the indicator for the whole mixture, right? Because PM 2 comes with the NO2, if they both come from a tailpipe, uh, if, you know, if, if, if they come from coal, there would be SO2 gas, right? Uh, sulfate tie in the particle. So those are very complex, uh, uh, um, you know, mixture. And it's just a methodology, meth meth methodologically it's very challenging to, to, to study. But in the lab, in the toxicology, if we isolate, compare different PM 2.5 with different chemical compositions, they do show differences in, in some markers, yeah. So that's a great question. So, and I don't, I can't think of a paper that's done that exact comparison. Um, we know obviously the PCBs because they're 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 fat loving uh, are in the breast milk, um, and it would be a very interesting comparison to look at. And again, it speaks to this question of what is a, a threshold amount, what what is a reasonable amount, if any. Um, that could be in the breast milk. So if anyone knows, if anyone was stored breast milk samples, that would actually be a good little methodological um, look. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for the great talks, both of you. It was really enjoyable. Um, Aaron, re regarding the, again, the getting back to breast milk, I think that is a really pressing need. And is it mainly the older PFOS and uh, compounds that are that are the problem in breast milk, or the newer ones, uh, so, newer agents not found in breast milk? Yeah, or? no. I, so it's all about what we've looked for. So so <laughs> far, we've only looked for the older ones, and um, and even that's pretty sparse. And they're obviously somewhat easier to measure. And keep in mind, we haven't done a lot of breast milk studies. The, the one that came out a year ago was the most comprehensive one in the United States, and that looked at, at the older um, uh, PFAS. Now, I think this, and it, this is the same question we have with the plastics and the, the phthalates. Is it the persistency and the accumulation of the dose, or is it the constant re-exposure over time that we're excreting out quickly? And again, I, in the breast milk, we haven't really spent a lot of time looking for the newer ones that are excreted quickly So, um, and would, in theory, just be constantly re-exposing uh, on a daily basis. So it's, again, another area that we need to, to look into. Um, and the, So uh, hopefully everyone's getting lots of ideas <laughs> on what we need, but it's definitely an area that needs to be examined. And then another question is regarding these communities that you're in, involved with currently in uh, Hoosick Falls and Newburgh, they've had a problem for a number of years in their water. Yeah. And what's the cr current situation? There have been engineering uh, attempts to clean up yeah, things? Ex and and yeah, how, how, much, how successful are those? Yeah, attempts? no, that's a, it's a great question. So Hoosick Falls, the um, exposure came from um, a floral chemical company uh, that made Teflon, so it's PFOA. They um, were able on the water system to put on a, a filter. So the carbon-based filters work well for the longer chain PFAS. They don't work as well for the shorter chain PFAS, but other filters can work better. So you, you, you have that option. They are actively um, trying to decide whether or not they're going to change the water source or just stick with a filter. Um, the community would like to change the water source, but then it's a, it's a question of where and how long, you know, what, what do they need to rebuild and is it going to get recontaminated again? Uh, so that is something they're working on with DEC and um, St. Gobain, which is the, the company. Now, Newburgh is a little bit more of a challenge because it's contamination from the nearby National um, Air Guard base. Um, their drinking water um, was Washington Lake. Um, that was contaminated by the firefighting foam. They've switched their water source to the same um, system that, New York, that feeds into New York City. So it's the, the Catskill system. In both communities, when we test, and we're testing a lot, they're, they're down to you can't really, we're not detecting P 
PFOA and PFOS in either community. Um, the, the challenge, of course, with Newburgh and other communities like Newburgh is that the, the cost um, of, of making sure so that the state um, and, and the DOD has put up a, a committee, both to cover the cost, but then the DOD has a committee of community members where they're trying to understand how best to remediate um, the, the situation. But again, um, there are limited options because they're, they're very persistent in terms of, of these older PFAS. Um, but since 2016, both drinking water systems have been safe from, with regards to the measurements of PFOA and PFOS. Well, that's really, that's really encouraging, but again, it, from, from your study perspective, you have to keep that in yeah, mind. So, at, so our eligibility criteria is they had to have lived in the two communities prior to 2016, um, which in Hoosick Falls is less of a, a, a challenge than Newburgh, which is as you would expect, um, but we do have a, a core group. Uh, our biggest challenge in recruitment in Hoosick Falls is that CDC had decided because they wanted an environmental exposure study, um, we could not recruit firefighters. So it was an ineligibility requirement, which we pushed back on because so many are, are volunteer firefighters. Um, so we're actually in the process of designing something for firefighters in the community. It was not well received by the community, um, understandably, that they they were not eligible for the for the study. And because it's such a small population, it, it had a significant impact on on our recruitment there. Um, but it is encouraging from um, in terms of the the water systems themselves. Newburgh is still dealing with the lead um, in the lead pipes, so that is an ongoing issue. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Any one question? Last one. <laughs> um, just a quick question for Dr. Bell. You mentioned that uh, women can, or pregnant women can get tested for PFAS if they're interested. Um, can you comment on how that occurs, practically speaking? Is that something that happens through cl clinical laboratories, or does it go through a state or county yeah, health no, department that... lab? And are there from an OBGYN field perspective, are there conversations that sort of, you know, OBGYNs know that this is something to discuss with patients in New York State? Okay, now that's a super question. I spend a lot of time on the phones with OBGYNs. So I, I should have been a little um, more specific. The, um, in New York, there are opportunities for residents of, of Hoosick Falls in Newburgh to, to be tested for free, but it's not a statewide program as of yet. That same National Academy report um, spends a lot of time discussing the, the autonomy and the justice around having availability of testing. If someone wishes to be tested for PFAS, the, it should be made available. And one of um, the challenges now is how to pay for that. So historically, the um, mantra from health departments and DECs was that, well, you don't want to have testing for everybody because we don't know what the clinical guidance is and there are harms and, and challenges with, with being tested. And the committee spent a lot of time reviewing that and, and ultimately landed on that this is a, an autonomy and a shared decision-making process. Um, and in the regards to justice, that if people want to know what their blood concentrations are, they should be have that available to them. But right now, there is no federal program or statewide program in any state that would allow that free of charge or covered through insurance. Um, we're working now with clinicians and, and others to try and, and find pathways uh, for people to get tested if they, they so wish to. In terms of talking to clinicians, I'm actually going next week, I'm giving um, a panel discussion at the um, American Conference of Occupational Environmental Medicine um, for clinical docs, and we're doing a lot of grand rounds with folks um, to make sure they're aware of, of this issue. But that's an excellent question, because they don't get training in medical school on, on uh, at least much on environmental issues. Thank you, Erin. So since I have the microphone, I will ask a last question. <laughs> I lied last time. <laughs> so I have a question for Jim. So we, we studied air pollution and with the birth outcome, and we see so many you know, inconsistent results, a different trimester, and with birth weight higher and lower. Um, I keep on wondering you know, how much of the 
air pollution concentration played a role in the inconsistent funding because there are studies from China, Mexico, India, and air pollution is very high, while in here we're five to 10 to 12. So what's your thoughts on you know, the role of the air pollution concentrations itself? I think that's, uh, that's really a good question. We need to be uh, further really uh, explored, maybe right next to Grant on that. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, uh, it's, it's interesting to see that for the cardiovascular endpoints, I think that's probably the most consistent one, even more consistent than on the respiratory outcomes in terms of a low-level air pollution impact. And uh, the, the levels in the United States, right, low level compared to, you mentioned China <clears throat> and India, the results are very consistent. And if you look at the dose response per unit increase in PM2.5 exposure with the, the, the changes on cardiovascular endpoints, it's greater at lower level, right? So whether that can be seen in the uh, you know, birth weight or preterm thing, uh, I, I think overall the, the, the results are less consistent. Then they come to the low, you know, low levels in, in, in the U.S., the, the results are even more inconsistent. So what's going on? I think you know, it's, it's a, maybe competing um, risk factors at lower level. Those will become more important to easily overwhelm that. Or maybe it's just uh, too complicated. The, the whole pregnancy is from, you know, mother's exposure come to uh, infant stuff, you know. I, I think it's more complicated, the biological uh, processes. So um, I, the, the other thing is this, uh, the, the study um, methods itself, you know. How we can find more... Uh, easily to sort of distinguish the exposure, uh, air pollution exposure, get that more accurate, and, and also control the other risk factors. I think that's the challenge at low levels. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang. Uh, thank you both very much. I think we can carry on the conversation for another half an hour. <laughs> but um, thank you uh, very much. From here, we'll take a very short break. We'll come back to 05, start uh, the next session. Thank you both. Okay, everyone, sorry we'll give you a very short break and also felt guilty to keep you inside when outside is so beautiful in the Friday afternoon. <laughs> All right, so uh, welcome back and we'll start the uh, second session uh, more on reproductive health. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker in this session, Dr. Robert Taylor. And Dr. Taylor is a professor of uh, obstetric and gynecology and assistant dean for student uh, academic affairs and the director of MD-PhD program at Jacob School of Medicine and Biomedical Science. Um, Dr. Taylor's laboratory investigates molecular and cellular biology of the human uterus and placenta. Dr. Taylor has served as a PI on many clinical translational grants and also have influential international, national, state executive committee, including the American Board of the OBGYN and the NIH Reproductive Science Development Program. He was recognized as ASRM Distinguished Research Award in 2007 and shared a 2015 Henry Rich. Did I say that right? Award for the pioneering work in the science and treatment of endometriosis from the Endometriosis Foundation of America with the late uh, Ronald Bat. Um, uh, with the late Ronald Bat. And Dr. Taylor's talk today is Oxidative Stress and Mechanism Underlying the Preterm Birth. Please join me. Welcome, Dr. Taylor. Is this working? Yes. Sounds like it. Great. Well, thanks so much. It's really a pleasure to come and listen to these talks. And to, um, I didn't realize I was going to get such an introduction. I don't want to take up too much time. Here, apologies to Salvador Dali, but 
you know, the regulation of labor is such an incredibly important thing from an evolutionary point of view. You can imagine that there are lots of alternative pathways. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a thesis where we think that at least one of the clocks for regulating labor and potentially preterm labor, labor is actually uh, driven by the fetal membranes, the amnion and chorion, which are kind of represented in this you know, clock here. But obviously, they're fetal contributions, maternal contributions. Um, it's, so uh, here's some disclosures. I don't think any of these are really particularly relevant. Uh, this is a, a, a Korean company that's interested in preterm birth developing kind of therapeutic interventions. I don't think what I'm going to talk about today is really very related to that. But the objective is to really discuss with you how oxidative stress might contribute and, and uh, to the onset of labor, and particularly preterm labor. So as you're all aware, preterm birth is a really global problem, a major problem. And in North America and in the African continent and really South Asia, um, we're not doing so well from a prevalence point of view. So you know, 12, 13 percent of deliveries are preterm in those uh, areas. And here in the United States, um, there's quite a bit of disparity uh, in different populations. So African American and Native American women are much more at risk of, of, of having a preterm birth uh, than, than white or Asian uh, Americans. And the trends are kind of improving, I think it's f fair to say, in, in recent years. But, uh, and fortunately, the very preterm births, less than 32 weeks gestation, kind of reflected in that lower uh, photograph there, the really morbid uh, and mortal uh, preterm birth has been pretty stable. But this is still a big... Uh, expensive problem uh, and one that causes a lot of heartbreak and, and disability, as you can imagine. So as I mentioned, there are a, multiple, a multitude of, of ways that preterm birth is, uh, you know, might be regulated. And these are actually all topics that I'm quite interested in and would love to, to, to talk to, to your group more, uh, more about. But today I'm just going to focus on, on this single pathway, this idea that the fetal membranes, and I'll describe what they are in just a second, that their sort of aging process might be an important clock driven by oxidative stress and potentially environmental influences that you all are talking about today uh, leading to preterm uh, delivery. So, you know, what are the fetal membranes? So I tried to capture some images here. Some of them are kind of more attractive than others. But actually, I think that in the lower left, the, the drawing almost represents the fetal membranes, you know, from my perspective, the best. So you can see the amniotic membrane kind of encircling the fetus, uh, abutting against the placenta in the bottom. Um, you can see that early in pregnancy, when the you know, sort of embryo fetal uh, development is, is quite early, the membranes are very, very flimsy and delicate. Closer to term, here we've got a term placenta. These membranes become really quite fibrotic and thickened. So uh, histologically, what the fetal membranes really represent are a layer of amnion epithelial cells. Those are the cells that are directly facing the fluid-filled space that's the amniotic cavity. There are mesenchymal cells, fibroblastic-like cells, and kind of a thick extracellular matrix. And then uh, 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 chorionic cytotrophoblast cells. Again, these are all extra embryonic uh, cells derived not from the fetus, but really from the placental precursor that give rise to these membranes. Um, and then beneath that are the maternal tissues. So these are all fetal, uh, extra embryonic, but, but, but sort of fetally derived tissues. And then beneath here, we'd have the decidua and the myometrium, which are the kind of the myometrium is the working part of the uterus. <clears throat> so the idea here is that the fetus, as it's developing and undergoing oxidative metabolism and growing, uh, is generating oxygen-free radicals. And these uh, reactive oxygen species, you know, in particular peroxide ions, superoxide uh, anions, and hydroxyl radicals, are actually molecules that have un- uh, that have uh, sort of unpaired electrons in the outer shell that give them a lot of uh, biological activity. As those are generated by the fetus, they come into contact with the amnion epithelium, and uh, there's injury that's induced. And that's kind of indicated 
here by these blue cells. The cells are actually induced to undergo aging or senescence as a result of being exposed to these oxygen-free radicals. And they actually do sort of, you can stain them to make them look blue and figure out where, which cells are undergoing senescence. And then these activate a whole cascade of biochemical products that include um, uh, cytokines and uh, recruit inflammatory cells, chemokines that include uh, recruit inflammatory cells, and set up this inflammation that actually activates the decidua and then the myometrium so that uterine contractions occur. So this little ticking of the clock generated by these oxygen-free radicals is one of the ways we think this is, you know, comes about. So this is related a little bit to telomeres, and I wanted to bring this in. So um, these three individuals won the Nobel Prize. We heard a little bit about the Nobel Peace Prize earlier today. This is the Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine for telomeres, the ends, uh, these sort of overhanging DNA, uh, three hydroxyl, uh, three prime ends of DNA, repetitive sequences that are quite heavily uh, guanosine nucleotides, and I'll come back to that. Those shorten with each cell cycle such that <clears throat> aging tissues, and the placenta is no different than others. Um, these were placentas that we collected um, uh, uh, when I was at Wake Forest at the time um, uh, with Dr. Yu, who's actually in the uh, audience here, um, across pregnancy. And uh, we collected these samples, and you can see that at term, at term pregnancy, the telomere length is the shortest because as each cell cycle occurs, telomeres get progressively shorter. So term pregnancies kind of fall down at this end. Preterm pregnancies, as expected, have longer telomeres. They haven't undergone so many cell cycles. And an interesting subpopulation that we looked at <clears throat> were PPROM. This is preterm, pre-labor rupture of membranes. This is a a condition in which usually there's sort of a spontaneous rupture of the bag of water and labor you know, continues. <clears throat> What's interesting about this group is that even though their gestational age is really about the same as the preterm delivery group, the telomere length is approaching that of the term group. In fact, the telomeres in those pregnancies are about 2,000 base pairs shorter than, um, than the preterm birth that... Um, wasn't caused by pre-prom, oftentimes indicated preterm births because of fetal anomalies or something. <clears throat> so uh, this probably accounts for about 20 or so cell cycles, and we think that this is a, 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 a sort of a accelerated maturity of that process. <clears throat> now, we've heard a lot about a lot of these environmental factors today. There are kind of intrinsic factors that generate oxygen-free radicals, inflammation, immune cells, uh, mitochondrial metabolism itself. And this gives rise you know, to these oxygen-free radicals that we think are important. And, and as I mentioned to you, guanines, which are quite rich in the telomeres, um, are actually a target for this oxidative step. And uh, this is a really an important uh, change to the, to the DNA structure. I won't talk about that for a second, just for time. So I thought I should, for a group like this, I should quote a famous biostatistician. And so I like this quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this is one that we've kind of studied, um, which was to create cigarette smoke extracts um, that we can actually put into cell culture or organ culture. And so um, these are cigarette smoke camels from Winston-Salem. Uh, and if you took, take fragments of fetal membranes and put them into culture for uh, a period of 24 hours in control buffer or buffer that contains the cigarette smoke extracts, you can see that the amnion epithelial cells start to become much more electron dense, dark in color, and you can start to see these little microvilli, which are really sort of a stress response from those. And you can stain the membranes uh, with other markers of oxidative stress, or in this case, oxidative and nitrosative stress, uh, three nitrotyrosine to sort of show what cells are kind of uh, getting this sort of injured uh, essentially by the oxidative stress from the cigarette smoke extract. And there's an example of kind of what oxidative stress can do to an apple on the, on the counter. So 
DNA damage is actually kind of part of this uh, story. And you can see here that if we take a normal amnion cell and put it into an agrose culture, um, that its DNA stays intact, whereas there's a, a flare or a comet tail that occurs because the uh, DNA is degraded. And I'd just like to point out that in the future, I think the kinds of models that we're going to use are a little bit different and include these microfluidic devices where we can really try to recreate the amniotic membrane. So here you have amnion epithelial cells, mesenchymal cells, the cytotrophoblastic uh, trophoblasts, and then beneath those, the maternal cells. And as we move forward and develop these models, um, and I don't think I'll show this to you again, uh, those might be kind of new approaches that we can use to try to understand this. So to wrap this up, inflammation mediated by um, reactive oxygen species is a final common pathway to preterm birth, and it can be activated by a whole variety of processes, including there's really pretty interesting data showing that psychological stress can actually be one of the causes that, that activates this uh, oxidative damage. Um, accelerated amniocorion membrane aging might be part of this PPROM uh, example that I showed you. Activates uh, inflammatory genes I didn't I took out a couple of other slides that I wasn't going to talk about. And again, these uh, scavengers for reactive oxygen species might actually be developed in the future as a way of, of intervening. <clears throat> but uh, so with that, I just want to say that we've got lots of evidence, I think, for this being an interesting pathway that we can potentially pharmacologically intervene about and also use to sort of much better understand the, uh, uh, the process. So... A lot of people have helped to contribute to this in terms of uh, grants, but Dr. Yu is the one who really very fastidiously sort of worked out our telomere assay and helped us kind of understand that aspect of it. So thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the presentation. Thank you so much, Robert. Any questions? Yeah, Jim. Great. That's... That, that's uh... Something I've been, I've been interested in for a long time, you can see that I look into air pollution impact on the oxidative pathway. And I didn't realize that, you know, MDA uh, is a, bio, a stable byproduct of uh, the membrane peroxidation. I, I, I had a fortune to find that molecule or re associated with lots of things. So, so published lots of papers on that. So given what you just said, uh, Question is uh, two questions. One is the the if we go to looking for this those oxidative st stress biomarkers, uh, MDA also the DNA oxidation with the 8OHDG. Um, the samples in the other study I presented, like a maternal blood um, and uh, placenta. Um, how that will be correlated with the, the things that will be related to the preterm birth? Yeah, so th those are great questions. We've got, we've got very good biomarkers, but you're right. Some of these don't have great shelf lives. Um, so uh, malonyl di dialdehyde, the MDA marker that you've used, um, is a good one in kind of fresh samples, it's a, little, it's a little trickier to use in frozen samples. Um, uh, so I guess one question would be, yeah, wh what sorts of samples are, are you preparing? Um, how are you sort of storing those samples? And what are the assays that you're using to look at them? Um, we've, again, had the sort of ability to, or the approach is to kind of grow the cells so they're kind of actively metabolizing. They're sort of in a healthy state, and we can sort of carry some of that phenotype in vitro to cause oxidative stress, for example, outside of the, the pregnancy. Your interest is really more sort of tracking that within individuals. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think we'll get better markers as we go along, for sure. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. I, Robert, I actually have a question. So the telomere lens, you... Uh, presented it's very interesting. We've done some telomere lens measurement in our 
pregnancy, uh, pregnancy cohort too. I wonder the telomere lens you, you measured was among the mothers. I guess you probably mentioned it. I just um, these are actually from, the, from, from fetal membranes, actually, that we oh, took from those. From I'm sorry, fetal I, should, I should have said that. Yeah, so we collected the fetal membranes at the different times of pregnancy. So our earliest pregnancies were kind of super preterm, 23 weeks. Uh, those are pretty hard to get, typically. And then, you know, throughout the rest of the course of, of pregnancy, we sort of accumulated those and then found, really, we're surprised to find that this PPROM group sort of dropped out and it looked, you know, different than the others. And, I see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But so those are from fetal membranes. The placenta, per se, has sort of similar changes. Um, and we didn't look at uh, maternal leukocytes, I don't think. We've had, I don't know that we've done that. We would expect those not, those would be more reflective of the mother's mm -hmm. age. Uh, but again, there's not a perfect correlation there. Yeah, we measure some in the placenta, some in the cord blood too as a, as a pair. I guess a lot of more to, yeah. to explore what we would know. All right. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Taylor. Jen. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. Our next speaker is Luann Brown, CEO of the Buffalo Prenatal Perinatal Network, which is one of 16 comprehensive networks established by New York State in 1987. The Buffalo Prenatal Perinatal Network's focus is to improve pregnancy outcomes, promote better maternal and infant child health care, establish better linkages between existing programs, and ensure that families have access to the full range of preventative and primary health care, social support, and educational resources in Erie County. The agency currently houses the Healthy Families Home-Based Parenting Program, the Maternal Infant Child Health Care Collaborative, Community Health Worker Program, and the Responsible Fatherhood Initiative. Her talk today is entitled Maternal Mortality Crisis in the U.S. Good afternoon. So I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm just switching here, right, to change the slides down here. Okay, all right. So unless you've lived in a cave the last year, I'm sure you've all heard about maternal mortality. And I will say that I think this was really, including morbidity, was kicked off by Serena Williams, the tennis player. Um, many of you may know when she had her baby. Um, she was convinced she had a pulmonary embolus and no one listened to her. And she did have a pulmonary embolus. And I think after that incident, people were paying a lot more attention to moms and what they were saying. So New York State, um, our previous governor, Andrew Cuomo, actually put a women's agenda together several years ago. And one of the, one of the, uh, the points that he did was he wanted to have a maternal mortality review board. So that report, this is the first report from that group, and it's from 2018, so it's a little dated. But I also have some recent numbers that came out nationally. So in 2018, there were 41 pregnancy-related deaths. Uh, most of them occurred in women 30 and older. Uh, white women were 49% of these deaths, while black women were 32.5%. Um, Black women, while they comprise 32% of the pregnancy associated deaths, they had 14% of the live births. Education levels were evenly split between those women who, who completed some college and those who had a high school education or less. And recent research has shown that black women, regardless, if they are a college-educated black women, they may still have poor outcomes than a white high school graduate. Most of the women were also on Medicaid, as you can see, 60%. Over half of them occurred within the 42 days at the end of pregnancy. So that fourth trimester they talk about is very important. That's a lot of times when these issues occur. The leading causes of pregnancy-related deaths were embolism, hemorrhage, and mental health conditions, which include suicide. Black women had a pregnancy-related mortality five times i say that again, five times higher than white women. Discrimination was a probable or definite circumstances surrounding 46% of the pregnancy, 
Now, this Maternal Mortality Task Force was a multidisciplinary group. There were OBs, there were midwives. It was very multidisciplinary. Obesity was also considered a likely or certain circumstance in 22% of the pregnancy-related deaths. And it was determined that 78% of the deaths were preventable. So they looked at different factors. They're all up here, but like community factors, those were things like the mom may not have known, like didn't have enough knowledge about what warning signs of, of problems were. The stigma surrounding mental health, which doesn't, doesn't impact women or black women, certainly higher in black women, but it impacts everybody. Some places had slower EMS services and disadvantaged communities. Uh, patient or family factors, they were very careful about assigning this because they didn't want to assign blame to the family, but it included things like, again, inadequate education, resources available. Um, chronic conditions place the patient at higher risk for less favorable pregnancy outcomes, depression, anxiety, history of substance abuse, and their impact on the, the patient seeking med necessary medical or behavioral interventions. Also, language barriers. So they identified 155 contributing factors among the 41 deaths, and then they ranked them in these four categories. So there's a higher risk, as we also said, for black women, regardless of their level of education. The majority occurred after a live birth. Most deaths were non-Hispanic non white, most were never married, most had Medicaid, and the education levels again were split. Substance abuse disorder was the most common contributing factor for deaths due to accidental manner. And that number of substance abuse deaths, I will tell you, like probably tripled during COVID. Now, these figures just came out, which are kind of scary to look at, but this, was, this is national US. So you'll see that in 2021, um, there were, in 2019, if we look a little further, 20.1 deaths per 100,000. In 2021, it was 32.9 for black women. Again, the income or the education of black women does not alter their outcomes. So because you're educated, because you have money, like Serena Williams, doesn't exalve you from be becoming a, a victim here. The rates also increased, as you'll see, with, with age. So somebody over 40, it was 138.5 deaths. The rates increased during COVID, especially with black and Hispanic women, um, was almost 33% increase after March of 20. And this was the first time that maternal deaths among Hispanic women were higher than among white women. Usually, it was it, usually they were down farther. Again, occurred more than a half, more than a week after birth, 22% during pregnancy, and 13% the day of delivery. Mental health was the leading cause for white and Hispanic women, heart conditions for black women. Asian women had higher rates of hemorrhage. And then the other causes were infection, embolism, and cardiomyopathy. Majority in the urban areas, areas increased. There was also an increase in maternal homicides in 2020. And they felt like this was related to the pandemic and a lot of economic pressure. Plus, there was a jump in gun ownership. Abortion restrictions have also had an impact. Um, those states, when they wrote to the states that have had restrictions, they had maternal death rates that were 62% higher. There's an increased chance of hemorrhage there. The interesting is thing is that black women born in the United States are more likely to have complications. If we have a woman that emigrates from Africa, she has a better outcome. And they attribute this to, and the, the phrase they use is weathering, because black women in the United States are exposed to systemic racism throughout their lives. And this causes them to have worse outcomes. And it might be premature birth, it might be other morbidities or mortality. One of the, the countries that does very well in maternal mortality is Sweden. 
because you know United States is not in the top ten. I will tell you that with this with this uh, this issue, and they attribute Sweden's excellent rates because they have universal health insurance with low out of pocket costs. Actually, did, midwives deliver most of their babies, which is pretty typical in Europe. Uh, they have long paid leaves and they have subsidized child care. They really take care of the mom. You know, it's not like a six week thing and you're done. It's, they really watch them for the whole year. And that's it. I think the only other thing, how much time do I have? Oh, okay. Um, I think the only thing I want to say is that. Um, it's embarrassing for us to be in a, I mean, to be, have these numbers. We're not a third world country, okay? We are a developed country, and the fact that we have um, these numbers is, is embarrassing to me. And some of the solutions that people have come up with, um, there's underserved areas, they call them maternity deserts, where they don't have OB providers or hospitals close. So they've talked about telehealth for those areas. Um, my favorite solution, because it helps my agency, is that we need to have investing in community-based organizations like my agency that is out with the moms all the time. So we do home visits. We're in their homes. We're with them all the time. We see what they're doing. We see what they're eating. We see that they're sleeping on the floor. We, we help to identify a lot of social determinants of health that other people, you know, when you're in the hospital or you're going to your doctor's office, you don't see them that often. We see them a lot. Uh, hospitals have done a lot with bundles and simulation training, you know, with hemorrhage training. They have a hemorrhage cart to try to address so that they do drills so that when a mom goes, starts to hemorrhage, they pull the cart, everyone knows what they're doing. Um, regionalizing care, which is what we do in New York State, uh, you know, we have levels. The Department of Health sets levels. If you're considered a regional perinatal center, you have to meet certain criteria compared to a level one like a small community hospital. So they want women who are high risk to be delivering at a, at a regional perinatal center because that's where the resources are for those moms. Obviously, education with our clients. You know, we need to be talking to clients about these things, about, you know, this is what you need. Do you have a constant headache? Um, I think I saw signs out there for the movie Aftershock, the documentary. If you haven't watched it, please do. It's on Hulu. It tells the story of two black dads who lost their partners. Um, and they've both become big advocates as well as the mom of one of the, of, the, of the clients. But it's really impactful to watch it. They also, and we have this in New York as far as increasing postpartum coverage to one year. You saw the numbers up there. Things happen after they go home. When do you think mental health issues happen? Now they're home, they have no sleep. Some of them don't have any support. That's when they need the support. And you're not seeing your OB for six weeks. That's way too long. By then, you're, you're totally stress level. You know, doulas and midwives, I'm an OB nurse. I have a lot of respect for OB docs. I've worked with great OB docs. But doulas and midwives have shown to also have very good outcomes. The midwives clinically, because they do very low tech, efficient quality care, they kind of let labor and delivery progress as it's going to happen. Doulas as non-clinical people provide support to moms who need it. So a lot of our moms, they don't have any support. So when they go in, they advocate for them. They see them prenatally. They're in there during their labor with them. Um, they speak up for them, and they see them postpartum. And it's made a huge impact. I mean, New York City just put a, a policy in place that every mom can get a doula now in New York City. Implicit bias, which I'm sure you guys have heard about. We all have our biases. Um, you know, they are out there. We have to obviously do a lot of education with all our providers, whether that's nurses, whether that's doctors, whether that's social workers, but um, there's a lot of misperceptions out there. One of our clients, um, I'm reported back and, you know, well, I'm black, so I don't have any pain. That's what they told me, I have thicker skin. That's the kind of stuff they hear. So, you know, and people don't do it deliberately. It's just that, you know, if you're not used to working with a certain culture, sometimes you make assumptions, which really aren't true. Obviously, home visiting services, which I already mentioned, and reduction of low-risk C-sections, which a C-section is still a major surgery. You know, I, I always used to amaze me. These women would say, well, I want to have a C-section on this day because it's my father's birthday. I'm like... It's a major surgery. Why would you even like try to do that? There's times when you need a stat section, but not all the time. So something we have to be aware of, we have to do better at. 
Uh, it's a national problem, and uh, there are solutions, but it's, it's going to take some time to get there. That's it. Thank you. We might have time for one or two questions. Do you have any questions for Luann Brown? Okay. Luann and I work together, so. Um, no, you did a great job on mortality. Can you just talk a little bit about morbidity and, and how much injury can happen? I think the morbidity um, I think the numbers actually for mortality, maternal mortality, I just looked for this area was like 10, which is, doesn't seem like a lot, but somebody said to me, that's 10 kids without moms. So, but the morbidity issues, the, you know, the blood pressure issues, the obesity issues, the diabetes issues, those, they all have an impact and a cost to all of us because if that mom is not being treated, I mean, we really push to have our moms make sure they have a primary care provider as well as an OB. They think their OB is their primary care, and that's not, they have to have a primary care doc. So I think that all of those conditions, again, which need to be assessed and they need to be seeing the right people, um, would help with those numbers. But it's probably more of, it's more of a cost than the mortality because they could live with that condition for a long time. Yes. So um, thank you for sharing all this mm -hmm. and, and making it work because this is really important. But I'm wondering whether there's any overlap in the line of saying you can't treat a child for a long time in a coma would be another separate focus area. Um, yeah, we actually, are there people here from uh, Renew? I think I, I've actually, Diane, yeah. Yeah, they were here. They're actually presenting to my staff, but. Environmentally, because we do social determinants of health, so when we walk in and do our first screen with a mom, and you know, you can imagine that most of our moms are on Medicaid and they do not live in the, you know, mansions. They're living in very substandard housing. So we are assessing when we walk in there for lead. Um, we get moms moved out. We have a program right now with the city of Buffalo where, you know, our landlords are not always really kind to our clients. So we actually are able to get inspections done and get them cited. Um, the, the inspectors always try to do that, but the, our clients aren't going to open the doors to them because they don't know them. But if my community health worker is with them, they will. So we do a lot of assessment on the home environment with lead. We have a smoking cessation program, which actually we kind of tabled for a couple of years because we didn't have many moms. But during COVID, we had 10 moms that started smoking. So we do a program, we measure their CO2, and then we incentivize them if they stay smoke-free. We give them diapers, which are very expensive if you haven't bought them recently. Um, so those are kind of the environmental things we do. And we obviously screen for substance abuse and alcohol, all that kind of stuff. Anything else? Yes. Hi. Yes, I think it's, you know, my staff, I think the reason my programs are successful is because my staff are from the communities they serve. 10% of my staff are former program participants. So they're, you know, we serve primarily African American and Hispanic moms, and that's what my staff is. It, you know, and it does make a difference because they're trusted when they go out in the community. Um, I'm actually working on a project with implicit bias with a, she's an actress actually from LA that's written some stuff, but we want to do actually do a training that could be shared with med students, residents, nursing students, but do it in a theater format, because I think that's more engaging, where she would do vignettes about implicit bias and show scenarios. Because, you know, I, nobody wants to do, nobody does that deliberately. It's just the way you were raised and what you were exposed to. But I think by heightening awareness of what the, what the clients say, because sometimes we don't listen to them. And I think that that will help, and I think it'll be a little bit more engaging for the students. Anything else? Yes. Hmm. 
That is another thing. So my program is, I have two women's programs and I have a fatherhood program as well because dads are just as important. But we screen for domestic violence, substance abuse, and depression. Um, our substance abuse clients, we refer to usually Lighthouse to get them in treatment, but then we continue to follow them. Um, I also have uh, Dr. Davina Moss, in case you know her. She's quite well-known and works with substance abusing clients. She's actually on my board now. So those are the resources. A lot of My staff are not clinical people. They're community health workers. So but they know all the resources they can refer people to. So if it's a domestic violence, we take them to Family Justice Center. If it's depression, uh, we get them into, we actually started, we have a lot of support groups that we offer at the agency. Breastfeeding, we're big breastfeeding support groups, educational support groups, but we found a couple years ago, a lot of our moms were testing high. We use the Edinburgh scale, and they don't wanna go to a counselor because they're afraid someone's gonna take the baby away. So we contracted with Horizon Health, and now we have our own mental health counselor that comes in once a month, meets with the moms, and our goal is to get them comfortable with counseling so they'll go to individual counseling. But, yeah, we've had women, the first session we had, we had a woman come in and say, yeah, I had, I'm really glad you did this because I had a knife at my wrist yesterday. I mean, it's a real problem, and I, it's such a stigma with black and Hispanic cultures that they don't think this is their thing. So that's... That's our job. We, we kind of identify the issues and we send them where they need to go. And we make sure they go too. Sometimes we drive them there. That's why we have very good outcomes with our prenatal care. We make the appointments. A lot of times we go with them. Uh, we translate for our Spanish moms. We interpret for them. We advocate for them. And we're with them all the time so they can't get rid of us. So we're just constantly in their face so that you know, they, they don't have a choice. Thank you very much for all of your, your insight. I know we had a few more questions for Luann, so let's hold those until the very end. We do have a built-in question and answer session, and she might be kind enough to, to share some more answers and perspectives with us. Our last speaker of this particular session is Dr. Elizabeth Bartelt, who's clinical assistant professor in the Department of Community Health and Health Behavior here in the school. She's a health educator whose research focuses on um, Sexual and gender minority, commonly known as LGBTQ+, reproductive health access and experiences. She received the Highly Competitive Society for Family Planning Emerging Fellows Research Grant to complete her dissertation work. Dr. Bartelt worked for many years in the field of public health before obtaining her PhD, including serving as a AmeriCorps VISTA member and is working as a sexuality educator for Planned Parenthood. Dr. Bartelt's talk today is entitled Identity Erasure Through Routine Healthcare, 18 to 26 year old LGBTQ plus experience of abortion in the United States. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much to the organizers for having me here. Um, thank you to the other participants for your great insights on um, healthcare today. Before I get too much further, I have to acknowledge the funding from Society for Family Planning. Please do note that this talk will include conversations about sexual assault, racism, transphobia, homophobia, and abortion. Please do take care of yourself and whatever that means for you today. All slides uh, with images are sourced as closely as possible on the images. Note that sometimes uh, social media finding of art is sometimes a little bit removed from the original source. Sexual and gender minoritized, as Jen very politely identified for us, is LGBTQ. IA+, or lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual, and many additional identities. Unintended pregnancy will not be used in this talk because many people, uh, whether or not they are trying to plan their pregnancies, may have unintended pregnancies or may have unintended um, planned pregnancies or unintended pregnancies that were not planned. And as an attempt to remove shaming or insinuating that pregnancies are always able to be planned. That term will not be used. Sexual assault does include rape, harassment, and consent violations. Young adult, in this case, refers to 16 to 26-year-olds. And white is specifically not capitalized as a step to not further racism in research in this study. Recruitment for this study was done through social media. All participants did select their own pseudonym at the end of the interviews. Interviews were semi-structured and conducted over Zoom. Of the 29 participants who uh, participated, only two used the video feature, though all were only audio methods were used for analysis. 
In an effort to maintain safety of all participants, participants were reminded that they could skip any questions. No questions were specifically asked about uh, racism or sexism or violence in relationships or sexual assault experience. However, you will hear throughout the rest of these slides that many, many of those experiences came up, unsurprisingly. When participants became noticeably emotionally imbued, um, i.e. sounds of tears or intense crying, they were reminded that they could end the interview early or that they could skip any questions. No one chose to do that. At the end of the interviews, participants were given the option of an additional talk line to, um, for additional support and resources afterwards. All of them chose to have that. Most of them disclosed to me at the end of the interviews that this was the very first time they had shared their abortion experience. Three people coded the interviews. I was the only person who conducted the interviews, and the code book was created through inductive and deductive analyses. We're going to start our conversation with this first quote from Rachel, who says, I feel like I'm not expected to experience abortion as a queer woman. Like, I don't even know what that means. What does it mean to have an abortion as a queer person? For many of the participants, they could not wrap their brains around simultaneously having an abortion and identifying as queer because they were supposed to, if they were queer, not experience pregnancy. And this was a big identity conflict for them. For Pink, they talked about it takes therapy and I guess a lot of openness asking for support from friends and community. And I guess showing vulnerability that like I'm going through a rough time and need help bouncing back. This was a really important part of their resiliency story. Before I move forward, I do want to specifically read the text on this image. I'm not usually reading the text on any of the images, but this one feels really important for the upcoming slides. Your queerness does not absolve your racism. So Casey embodies this quote, as did so many of them. Casey says there's really two kind of sides to the LGBTQ plus community. There's like the fire island, upper class, rich, white, cis side of it. And then there's the other side, which is poor, brown, and black, and disabled, unseen parts of the community that, like, we don't get spots on TV. And Casey goes on to say, I can't go to, like, any events or anything without seeing the Ellens and the Neil Patrick Harris's of the world. So, like, I'm going to connect with my community, but I don't feel connected to that part of the community. And that being such a struggle in understanding not only their queerness, but also their racial identity. Casey identified as a two-spirit um, person. For Pink, they went on to describe how this divide within the LGBTQ plus community uh, had equated for them and created all of this struggle to find their identity as a lesbian because they had been told for so long that it was inherently transphobic to identify as lesbian. And they said, you can be non-binary and lesbian. And that was such a beautiful revelation for them to understand. Rose similarly described finding her asexual identity as being, oh my God, I've been so much happier since I understood that and decided that. It was such a moment of joy. When it came to gender, many of the participants, um, seven of the participants identified as non-binary in some capacity. And note that I am using they and them for all of the participants in this talk, specifically to further anonymize participants. Luna here says, and I'm like, no, I don't experience gender dysphoria in that typical sense. I don't want to change my body. I want to change your perceptions of what my body needs to be. And so for them, it was this huge struggle of what people saw them as. And here we're moving into this aspect of identity that is saying, um, we, our identity is formed in part by how other people see us and how we relate to other people seeing our bodies changes how we describe and talk about our identity. Mellow Yellow similarly describes, sometimes I feel like the only way I can show up is through pronouns because otherwise people see me as any other way. And the only way I can actually describe my identity is by having you hear my pronouns. Rachel describes their identity as, and it's specifically in terms of their abortion, is saying the reason I decided to have an abortion was out of love because I didn't think I could raise a black child to love themselves in my current social reality. And I just know what that feels like. And I didn't want to 
not be able to help another person go and do that. Again, here we're seeing that impact of others' perceptions on our identity. Mallow Yellow similarly describes this sense of understanding their identity and the word that best fit their identity as, and I think that's also why I decided to identify as non-binary femme, because I feel like with race, there's this sense where like erasure means a sense of dehumanization there. They were specifically talking about losing their feminine identity as losing a vital part of their racial identity. When I asked participants if they came out to their healthcare providers on their, in terms of their sexual or gender identities, Matilda simply said, if it relates to care, I do. But Robin complicated that quite a lot by saying, I only come out if it's necessary, like to my gynecologist. Usually they are really nice and just say, oh, OK, that's fine. Just talk about what I need to know. But Robin felt like an inclusive provider would probably have more positive information because so many people had just made weird faces or like gave some information to discourage sexual orientation telling and disclosing. So several participants like Robin would say, I told my provider that I was lesbian, that I was bisexual, that I was queer, and the providers literally flinched or moved away from them. Sometimes they could tell that the provider didn't even realize that they were doing it, but that made the whole rest of that visit much harder to deal with. I asked all of the participants about their contraceptive use, both pre- and post-abortion. For Leanne, they talked about how they love their Mirena because it works so well with the testosterone that they were taking. And it caused a lot of gender affirmation because they hadn't had a period in eight months. And it was just a whole bunch of dysphoria that they got to toss in the garbage bin and that being really exciting for them. I asked all of the participants what they first thought of when they heard the word abortion. And most of them said, not ready. That was their biggest statement. Their second two biggest statements were love and joyful. These participants did not hate children. In fact, they loved children. Many of them went on to children, have children. Some of them had children before their abortions. This was not about hating children. It was about not being ready. When I asked about parenting intentions, Ty said, never in my life do I want to have children. Whereas Seven said, you know, um, I just love my son because he's so amazing. And Michelle said, the only reason I had a child was to be quote unquote normal. Because child, having a child was seen as a mark of womanhood, was seen as a mark of heterosexuality and normalness. And even though uh, they identified as bisexual, that felt like a really important step to be normal. When I asked about identity and abortion, Dragonfly said, I felt like such a statistic. And this might strike some of you as not that big of a deal, but I want you to really take a moment and think about what that feels like to feel like you are embodying the worst statistics of your identity and how heavy of a weight that was for many of these participants. Rachel went on to describe that they had previously had cancer, and that medical experience of having cancer was extremely painful, but then having an abortion was worse because of the social atmosphere around their abortion experience. For Sarah, they talk about how their experience with being black and having an abortion and being queer meant that many people did not understand it, and this was a lot more of a factor of white supremacy and the lack of health care for black folks than it was about all black people having abortions. April says this at the end of the interview, I was so worried that my story would be like not exciting and really heteronormative because for them, they felt like there wasn't that much interest in their story. Sarah said, well, when I disclose my abortion, I feel like people code me as either straight or cisgender, and it's so hard to feel like I can be seen as exactly who I am. Ezra had a lot of support from friends and family, but Sarah did not. Ezra's post-abortion experience was much better than Sarah's, unsurprisingly. And finally, we end here with a quote from Marsha. Until you really sit down and say, hey, I've had an abortion, you don't realize how many people have had them. Because it's, it's astronomical. I mean, it's one of the most common procedures in America. So these data do tell us that sexual and gender minoritized people have abortions that social support is really quite important and that connection to community reduces shame and stigma. Participants describe their identity with race, with gender, 
with orientation, with whether or not they had an abortion and whether or not they were a parent. And those flipped around based on how they were describing their situations. Um, Boleg, Crenshaw, and Meyer do a lot of great work on identity prioritization. For many, they had to do a lot of work to visibilize their identity and not fall into this trap of erasure because it was so common for people to read them as any other way. Intersectional community is so very much needed, both in terms of LGBTQ plus community, but also in terms of medicine. We need to ask our patients, are you LGBTQ plus? Are you a gender minority when we are doing this care? Of course, the study was only 29 people, so it can't be fully reflective of everyone, but I think it did a pretty good job. And with that, um, again, uh, know that abortion isn't a dirty word. I have to acknowledge a lot of people who helped me develop the interview guide and uh, make sure that I was doing this in a very thoughtful way. I think that I'm at time. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have maybe one or two questions, and then we will hold the rest until the end to the question and answer session. Questions for Dr. Bartelt? I'm, I'm assuming that these interviews have happened pre Roe v. Wade overturning. Is that? But did any in any of those interviews um, did some of this concept of what would they do if? Roe v. Wade being overturned uh, occurred, like how would that change their lives? How would that change their outcomes, their identities? So many, if not most of the participants lived in states that were extremely hostile to abortion access. So while Roe v. Wade hadn't been overturned at the national level, it certainly had at their state levels and they already knew what that experience was like. Many of them described having medical providers say to them, I have to read you something that is a lie, but the state is making me read. Um, for instance, Indiana state law says that you have to tell all patients who are getting an abortion that they are at an increased risk of breast cancer. That is not true. Um, and you have to tell them that as, a as the provider in your white coat. Um, and so that confuses a lot of people, right? Um, so these participants didn't have to wonder. They already knew that. Many had seen hostile images and billboards every day on their way into and out from work. Um, many of them had to walk through protesters to get into their clinics. Many of them had friends and family member, like you saw from Sarah, say you're going to hell if you do this procedure. Um, some of their family members disowned them after they found out. Time for one more question. If anyone has one more question. All right, we'll hold those and let's put our hands together again for Dr. Bartelt. Not only gave a great talk, but tried to get, tried desperately to get us back on track to our symposium timing. Our last session for today is an opportunity for graduate students to present their work. Our first student who is going to present is Divya Chaudhary, who's a PhD student in the Department of Exercise and Nutrition Science. Her talk is entitled Dietary pulse consumption during childhood is associated with improved nutrient outcomes in the first two years of life. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Divya Chaudhary. I'm a second year PhD student. So today I'm going to give a presentation uh, on the dietary bean consumption, how it is associated with improved nutrient outcomes in uh, the first two years of life. So what are dietary pulses? Dietary pulses, it is an edible seed that we get from a legume uh, plant. They have outstanding profile because they're rich in macronutrients such as uh, complex carbohydrates, proteins, and micronutrients such as potassium and uh, folate. And some examples are like beans, chickpeas that we consume in day-to-day -day life. They improve the overall diet quality. And uh, what are the major research gaps? So limited research has been done in early childhood to see the preventive benefits of the pulse consumption. And uh, we are not aware of much reports which have assessed the prevalence of pulses in children and infants. So the aim is to estimate the prevalence of pulses in children 
from time between 1 to 24 months. We would also look at the associations between child bean consumption with social demographic characteristics and the nutrient outcomes in infants at uh, 11 and 24 months. These are the two time points. So for the analysis, we did a secondary data analysis using the data set from the WIC ITFPS study 2. We followed mother and children. Total participants were 3,039. They were followed at different time points up to 24 months. Mothers mostly recorded the child's dietary consumption, and that was done to a 24-hour dietary recall system. Major outcome measures were social demographic characteristics, energy intake, and micronutrients and macronutrients. So this is a figure one, and this uh, talks about the percentage of infants who consumed dry beans and uh, for the dry beans and chili by age. And we can see at the six months, the consumption was very low. It started to increase from seven months with 1.2% and 0.4%. With the blue bar graph for the dried beans and orange bar graph for the chili consumption, we see that it was highest for dried beans at 18 months with 10.5% and for chili at 24 months with 5.9%. Next, we'll look at the association with social demographics and the bean consumption at 11, 24 months. On the left, we can see they, uh, we have the child characteristics like sex, race, and ethnicity. And we observed that a higher consumption for bean was observed in children who were white with 6.3% versus 1.3% for the black. And it was higher in Hispanic or Athena ethnicity with 8.5% versus 2.1%. We observed similar higher intake for the chili in the Hispanic and Latino ethnicity. On the right, we can see that uh, we observed higher consumption for dried beans for mothers who were married and those who were cohabitating with the father of the babies. Next, we'll look at the nutrient outcomes association with the bean consumption at 11 and 24 months. And we observed that the higher intake, we observed a higher intake for the total energy, as we can see, for the children who consumed dried beans 11 months with 975.05 uh, mean compared to non-consumers with 907.01. Similarly, we observed a higher intake for protein and other micronutrients like potassium, folate, and magnesium. We observed similar higher intake of macro and micronutrients for children who consumed chili at 11 and 24 months. Next, we'll talk about the limitations and the strengths. So it was a prospective design with a long follow-up. Some of the major limitations were recall bias as the dietary assessment was done through the 24-hour dietary recall system by the mothers. We had limited statistical power and we lacked information on the frequency or amount of the bean intake in the infants. And next, we conclude that the consumption of dry beans and chili differed by the race and ethnicity. We saw improved macro and micronutrients in children at early childhood. So for future prospects, we would like to see how pulse consumption during infancy and early childhood influences the longer term food preference, uh, preferences and the health outcomes. These are my references and thank you. Thank you so much, Divya. We're going to hold questions in this section until the very end. So we'll move on to our next speaker, Iwa Yua. Oh, I hope I pronounced your name close to correct. Uh, who is a PhD candidate in epidemiology and environmental health. Iwa's interests include nutritional epidemiology, women's health, and mental health. Her talk today is entitled Dietary Pattern and Periodontal Disease Among Postmenopausal Women. Hello, I'm Yi Hua. I'm the PhD candidate in epidemiology. Today, I will be presenting our study uh, focusing on postmenopausal women regarding the association between dietary pattern and periodontal disease. Periodontal disease is an infection and the inflammation occurred in the supporting tissues of the teeth. It can cause uh, gum inflammation, gum recession, deepening pocket, and bone loss. Periodontal disease is a leading cause of tooth loss uh, among adults and uh, is associated with systemic diseases. Periodontal disease has a high prevalence worldwide. Um, and uh, women after menopause are at an uh, increasing risk of developing periodontal disease because aging and reduction in estrogen levels are both risk factors. 
Some studies have investigated the association between nutrients or foods in relation to periodontal disease. And compared to single food or nutrient, dietary pattern can provide a more comprehensive representation to one's uh, overall diet. And one approach to assess dietary pattern is through score-based dietary pattern, which evaluates the adherence to certain dietary patterns or certain dietary guidelines by assigning scores to the dietary components and derive an overall dietary score. In this study, we examined the association between dietary pattern and periodontal disease. Uh, based on the data from osteoporosis and periodontal disease study, osteoperio study. Osteoperio study is a prospective cohort study consisting of postmenopausal women recruited from Women's Health Initiative Observational Study at Buffalo Clinical Center. Periodontal assessments were conducted at each visit of osteoperio cohort. Clinical measures include chronic indicators and acute indicators. Chronic, uh, chronic indicators include alveolar crystal height, clinical attachment level, which are the assessment of the uh, gum recession and alveolar bone loss. And uh, we also have the data of acute indicators, pocket probing depths, and the percentage of bleeding on probing, which are the indicators of gum inflammation. Uh, we also have the record of missing, missing teeth due to periodontal disease and periodontal disease progression on the radiography. Dietary behaviors were assessed by full frequency questionnaire and we calculated four dietary pattern scores. Healthy eating index, alternative healthy eating index, dietary approaches to stop hypertension, and alternate Mediterranean diet. The higher these scores, the healthier the diet. As for the cross-sectional association at osteoporosis baseline, uh, we found some negative associations, which means better adherence to the, um, to the dietary patterns are associated with less uh, gum recession, less gingival bleeding, and less missing teeth due to periodontal disease. We also investigated the prospective association during the first year of osteoporosis follow-up. And uh, in this analysis, we found some positive association. Means that the better adherence to AHEI and AMAT are positively associated with greater progression of bone loss. And it is opposite to our hypothesis. So we want to figure out why it occurred. And then we think there are two potential reasons. People with severe periodontal disease may lose their teeth during follow-up, and the lost teeth were not counted in the oral examination. So when the worst site was removed, then their overall mean measures can get improved. And another reason is that uh, periodontal disease can lead to systemic diseases, and people may improve their diet after their diagnosis before the baseline. So it can make the causal relationship reversed. To address these issues, we did some uh, sensitivity analysis. Firstly, we want to impute the clinical measures for the lost teeth, which were, uh, were not accounted. Uh, and then we want to exclude participants with diabetes, osteoporosis, hypertension, or heart diseases at baseline and all of these uh, comorbidities are associated with periodontal disease. And after the imputation and the exclusion, we found the original positive associations were attenuated, and the association shifted toward the negative direction. The same situation also occurred uh, in the association during 17-year follow-up. After the imputation and the exclusion of com uh, comorbidities, uh, the uh, original positive associations no longer remain. In conclusion, better adherence to dietary patterns was cross-sectionally associated with better periodontal health, 
but prospect, uh, prospectively associated with more progression of periodontal disease over follow-up. However, this association may be uh, attributed by the unaccounted tooth loss or comorbidities. So the future studies may want to uh, consider these two factors, the temporal sequence and the causal relationship. Uh, we want to acknowledge our co-authors, collaborators, funding sources, and all participants in osteo uh, osteoperial cohort for their contri contributions. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Iwa. Thank you very much. We'll hold questions again until the question and answer session momentarily. Well, a few minutes. Um, our next speaker is... Xingyu Qian, a PhD candidate in Global Gender Studies in the College of Arts and Sciences. Xingyu's research interests focus on women's health during wars and conflicts in Asia. Her, her talk is entitled, The Effects of Wars and Conflicts on Maternal Health Outcomes in Asia from 1950 to 2010. Hello, I'm Xin Yu Chen. Today I'm going to talk about the facts of wars and conflicts on maternal health outcomes in Asia from 1950 to 2010. In general, in the past 60 years, one third of the countries in Asia have been through conflicts with one another, sometimes with some outside, source, outside forces like US, like Russia. And the conflicts have an ongoing impact on women's health, economic and social infrastructure, and, um, and internal displacement. However, the impact on maternal health outcomes in developing countries uh, it is rarely studied. So it's it, unlike developed countries like North America, US, Canada, or Europe, the issue is less clear in war-affected areas in Asia in, as a developing uh, region. So my study uh, aims to examine the impact of armed conflict on maternal health outcomes. I use correlation and regression analysis to analyze the relationships between maternal health indicators such as uh, some group birth rate, fertility rate, maternal mortality ratio, and conflict types, internal displacement, and gender-based violence at the country year level. Additionally, I compare the effects of one conflicts to the same indicators uh, during times of peace. So I compare wartime with peacetime with a bunch of, uh, with the same indicators. So in my study, I examined the impact of conflict on maternal health after 1950. So my study focused on three key indicators, total fertility rate, crude birth rate, and maternal mortality ratio. I select countries that were in war as compared to peacetime after 1950. And I create a database uh, which includes indicators of demographic changes, health system, government health, expenditure intensity and duration of war, and internal displacement, gender-based violence from the countries. So my data sources, basically from UN, World Bank, and for some of the missing years, I use the data from the government report, such as the statistical yearbook some of the National Bureau of Statistics and some of the annual health report by government. So in total, I have a 920 country year observations. So here is the funding, findings. Figures 1A, 2A, and 3A shows the trend in maternal health indicators, fertility rate, group birth rate, and maternal mortality ratio from 1950 to 2010, while figures 1B, 2B, and 3B shows the changes during wartime. And figure 4 shows the total fertility rate by country year. So according to previous studies, there has been significant progress in improving maternal health in Asian countries. And these progress can be reflected in the trends showing 1A, 2A, and 3A, so we can see it's a decreasing trend. 
and figures 1B, 2B, and 3B shows, although we have a decreasing trend in general, uh, however, the fertility rate and the maternal mortality ratio, it does not apply during conflict. Sometimes even with available maternal health care, the rates can increase due to disruptions in contraceptive and family planning services. As conflict also increases the risk of sexual violence, leading to forced displacement and insecurity, contributing to higher maternal mortality ratio. And the fear of four, we have very uh, different trends in fertility rate in the region. And we can identify like three distinct patterns. Some countries like Nepal and Pakistan, uh, they have implemented supportive family planning policies. So we have a gradual decline in fertility rate for countries like Sri Lanka that have policies promoting women's empowerment experiencing. So these countries experience an initial plateau followed by a sharp decline in fertility rate. For countries that have undergone periods of conflict or turmoil, so the countries like China, North Korea, South Korea, and Vietnam, so they have experienced sudden increase in fertility rate. And for countries like Afghanistan and Cambodia, so they experience initial increasing fertility rate during or after periods of turmoil and followed by a gradual decline towards lower rate. So for the findings, so there is one part worth noticing during wartime, higher conflict-related gender-based violence and lower, for, lower fertility rate. So it's a negative and significant association. So it's important to know that the negative correlation could be due to underreporting or lack of documentation of birth registration during wartime. So usually it's really messy. You cannot keep the records. And sometimes if you have a baby, you cannot uh, report to the government. For the findings of maternal mortality ratio, so there are a few parts worth noticing. Um, more physicians, higher maternal mortality ratio. So one of the explanation is increase in the number of physicians does not necessarily translate to health professionals or like OB or those uh, in maternal health. So although we have a total of great number of physicians, it doesn't mean we have enough OBs. So increased over the number, oh, sorry. The second is increased number of internally displaced persons linked to higher maternal mortality ratio. So this is perhaps due to disruptive health services, inadequate medical care and poor living conditions. And we have a surprising finding is more hospital beds during more time linked to higher maternal mortality ratio. So usually wounded soldiers, they have the priority of to receive baths, leaving fewer resources for pregnant women. So also limited health care during wartime, transportation disrupted, and the supply, medical supply disruption may also worsen the impact. And we have a counterintuitive result. During times of war, uh, increase in conflict-related gender-based violence is associated with a decrease in the number of women who die from child-related complications, the maternal mortality ratio. So this is perhaps due to the improved healthcare access and the increasing awareness of women's health and also the relative success of NGOs and other international organizations in providing to refugee population. So these populations usually are overrepresented by women and children. So this is one of the explanations for that. In conclusion, so this is highly complex relationship between these indicators, variables during wartime. So some of the findings still requires further investigation. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Xingyu. Very interesting work. Our final graduate student speaker today is Sarah Lima, who's a PhD student in the Department of Epidemiology and Environmental Health. Sarah's talk today is entitled Breast Cancer, More Than Just Reproductive Risk Factors. Uh, 
Okay, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. So um, breast cancer has a long history with reproductive factors, uh, originally being observed as early as in the 1700s when nuns were found to have a higher incidence rate and mortality rate. Um, so it was called the nuns disease for a while. Since then, reproductive factors have been well established through a number of studies, including prospective cohort studies, as an important risk factor for breast cancer. And particularly of note is parity, which is the number of live births, um, which is a protective factor. Over time, there's been a dramatic uh, increase in early onset breast cancer. So these are uh, women that are premenopausal. And because of their age group, it's not believed to be a result of a screening bias. Um, so because of this concerning increase, there's been a lot of interest in evaluating reproductive factors and how those have changed over time and whether that explains the um, trends in cancer. So a 2018 study investigated whether the number of live births since 1980 uh, was contributing to breast cancer incidence and did find that those parity trends um, explained breast cancer incidence. And you can even see this visually with uh, the trends in parity over time on the left and the inverse relationship with breast cancer on the right. So my colleagues and I decided to replicate this study by using data from the Connecticut Tumor Registry, which starts in 1935. And when we do a cutoff at 1976, shown here, um, which is when the Sierra National Cancer, Cancer Registry start, we see a similar association where parity, which are the um, lines that are dotted, uh, decrease over time, whereas breast cancer increases. But when we look at the full time range, we can see a lot of fluctuations with parity, um, including the baby boom, which is that peak in the middle. Um, and despite that, uh, those changes in parity, we see a consistent increase in breast cancer incidence among young women that are younger than 40 years old. Um, and when we actually ran models, we found that uh, adjusting for parity does not explain the temporal trends in breast cancer. <coughs> So we decided to do a similar study looking at breast cancer and fertility over time across global regions. And so here in this figure, each point is a country um, in the different regions. And we can see over time, fertility rate on the x-axis decreases, whereas breast cancer incidence on the y generally increases. So another similar pattern. And we found that um, over time, there's been a significant increase in nearly all global regions and across all age groups. Um, so I'm showing here the annual percentage change, which is um, per year, how much does the breast cancer incidence rate uh, change, with a darker red indicating a positive value. And this increase per year uh, persisted even when we adjusted for country level fertility rates. Um, and something important to recognize is that fertility rates uh, declined in all countries. So again, um, suggesting that the changes in fertility are not the driving factors for the increase in breast cancer. So overall, these um, studies showed that breast cancer, particularly among young women, is undergoing um, an a significant increase over time, and these are not explained by changes in parity or fertility, and could instead maybe be explained by changes in environmental factors or behavioral factors, which have also changed drastically over time. But despite this, there's still a strong narrative that reproductive factors are explaining these um, increase in breast cancer trends, with a recent uh, review article stating that declining trends in fertility rates have contributed to the increase in incidence in premenopausal breast cancer. And I found that this statement was interesting because the articles that they cited here are the studies that I presented here today, which in fact find the opposite. Um, so I think this is an example of atomistic fallacy where the uh, evidence coming from the prospective cohort studies is so strong that um, people assume it must be an important factor, and especially given that we know that um, parity and fertility have undergone these declines. But those studies are using individual level data, so it's not appropriate to uh, take those results and interpret them onto a population level observation. And so I wanted to talk about these things because women's is a health or is a constellation of risk factors, and I think we should be cautious against reducing women's health to reproductive factors. 
particularly given the historical uh, viewpoint where women are typically seen as reproductive entities. Um, and it's important to consider the environmental, socioeconomic, and behavioral factors as well, which is why today's talk on air poll pollution and PFAS, as well as all the other great talks, have been um, so exciting and interesting. So I'd like to acknowledge all of the um, individuals listed here, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, let's have, could we have our graduate student panelists come up to the front, please? And maybe we, we can have a few folks sit here, get you out of the glare of the projector a little bit. Do we have any questions for our panelists? And actually, all of the speakers. If you're not up at the front, I can move around with the microphone. Not a problem. Do we have any questions for our graduate student speakers? Properly. Uh, so I'm kind of curious, it's kind of a chicken and egg question, but in your model of uh, sort of us, you know, uh, postmenopausal status, osteoporosis, periodontal disease, you suggested that the inflammation causes bone loss, but I would imagine that hormone changes might also cause uh, bone loss that could then predispose to more maybe mobility, and then sort of periodontal disease on top of that. So is, is there a kind of a conventional wisdom about what the process is, or is it a complicated interaction of both of those things? Yes, yes. So uh, uh, estrogen, uh, the reduction in estrogen level uh, is associated with periodontal disease, typically through the pathway of uh, the uh, bone density. Yeah, so that is why we did the sensitivity analysis by excluding participants with osteoporosis. And uh, in our model, we also uh, look at when we want to adjust for the osteoporosis, what will it happen, but the result didn't change. Yeah, but it is a concern in this association. Uh, I uh, I need to look at it. So uh, I know they they both or they, they are both matters for the periodontal disease. Yeah, I will look at. Thank you. Other questions? Being blinded by the projector, I can't see half of you in the back. Sorry. <laughs> so I have a question for Jing Yu. Um, when you were showing your graphs, I notif uh, noticed that Syria, Yemen, Palestine were not among the countries you were looking at, even though they are um, experiencing a, more than a decade of conflict and war. So is there a reason you didn't look at those countries? Project, but this is will definitely be my uh, be my future research because I'm adding I'm having a database have all the data all together, but it will definitely be one part of my future research because currently I only include 15 Asian countries due to the length of dissertation. Uh, that's a lot of work. So probably in the future, I have a bigger project. I can apply some funding and kind of have some like. Uh, research assistants, some people to help me to do the work. So that is good observation. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, Tina. <laughs> Should have worn sneakers. <laughs> so my second question is, um, when you found that um, like there were uh, more survival during the conflict, like in those countries who experienced conflict, there were more pregnancy survivals. So um, I want, like you said a couple of potential reasons. Um, my question is, do you also think that because during the war and conflict, people usually tend to have 
less children. Is that also, could that be another reason? Is that why the uh, rates are lower because there were few pregnancies? People, uh, so for countries, let me say that with lower resources, people during conflict they tend to have we they tend to have more children instead have less children because having more family members is a way to uh, offset the economic and financial insecurity and also balance just make loss of the lost family members during wartime only so. Only for some countries like this, but for some countries it is not the case. People tend to have less because you have one more family member, so there are more spending. So, so that is why I say in the conclusion it is a highly complex relationship in between. So, although in some other parts of my dissertation I pull out some country and talk about them as a case specifically, it's a very good observation. <laughs> Got another question in the back. Sorry to continue the trend of asking you questions about your dissertation, but it's really interesting. <laughs> um, so my senior thesis was on uh, like women organizing during times of conflict and um, how like they created like kind of communities of care and support. And I wanted to see, like, it was, I focused specifically on Rwanda, Burundi, and uh, it's been a while, so I don't remember the third country. Um, but I wanted to see if that was something that you noticed or you, like, observed during, like, in your work and if that affected uh, maternal mortality at all. Yeah, I just wanted to know if you, um, if in your uh, research you've observed um, kind of women organizing communities of support um, and if that has impacted maternal mortality at all? I haven't done any research about women organization yet, but I have seen some one of the study that mentioned about, I think it's in Syria, Western Syria or some part. So uh, during, uh, during wartime, usually there's a traffic disruption. So women, they are in labor. It's hard to get to the hospital. So it's a, there's a study about uh, for women and the C-section, uh, the rates, about that. I would say definitely if the women can organize or even there's a community support like that, the maternal mortality, we can see a decreasing trend because during wartime, there were so many unpredictable factors, medical supply and the transportation. As some of us can see that during COVID about the supply chain disruption, it's kind of like that. But for developing countries like in Syria or in African countries, the situation can be even worse. Thank you. I think we might have time for perhaps one more question. And then certainly you're welcome to talk to the, the speakers at the end too. Question? Question? I'll hand it over to Dr. Mu now for closing remarks. Thank you all very much for your wonderful talk. And I really want to, you know, um, feel so wonderful all our graduate students. I gave them five minutes to present <laughs> a, a project. It's very challenging. Then they all did a wonderful job. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I, uh, want to thank you all for attending the Global Health Day Symposium. Thank you for staying until the end. It's not easy outside. It's uh, so beautiful. Uh, and want to thank you our, all our speakers who gave the uh, wonderful uh, uh, talk and also give, provide the insight on those such crucial, important issues around the women's house. And I want to thank you our partner from Center, UB Center of Global Health Equity for co-sponsor the event, and also our staff, <laughs> Jean Foster, and many other people who help organize the event. Thank you all very much, and hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.